Um, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming uh, Rory. Well, thanks, thanks, Cam, and thanks all of you again for braving the weather uh, and being here. Look, I, um, I want to offer a few remarks, some of which you'll recognise, and uh, yes, Indo-Pacific will get a few looks in, but not, not too many, I hope. And I apologise in advance to any of you who attended the speech I gave uh, at ANU, uh, I think in March, my inaugural speech in my new role. There is some, some overlap between that address and this, but I want to take my remarks there a little bit further tonight, which is why uh, this speech is titled Building Blocks of a New Australian Security. Uh, the previous one was about towards, I guess, a new Australian security, and hopefully the next speech will be about a new Australian security. But... We need to take our time. So um, I'm going to speak very much on the record and take your questions afterwards. Now, it's not surprising that as the, the new head of the National Security College at ANU, I'm here tonight to encourage us all to think more about national security. And in academic parlance, I could be accused of securitising issues just a little bit too much, but we'll see. The National Security College, which many of you know, and those of you who don't, I encourage you to get to know us a bit better, uh, is quite a unique and important national institution. And I interpret its purpose as being very much about fostering effective, innovative and inclusive approaches to Australia's national security. Now, this means ensuring that the national security community, community and by community, I refer primarily to the departments and agencies, uh, really the practitioners of Australian national security, uh, including the ADF, of course, but including also um, state police forces, state agencies, ensuring that the Australian national security community remains informed, connected and responsive in a world of change. And part of this involves encouraging that community uh, and challenging them and the wider community too to think and to think anew. Now, some will argue that we're thinking plenty about national security already, but I would contend that talking about national security and thinking about national security are not automatically the same thing. Uh, to be sure, there is talk, there's media coverage, there's political attention aplenty. Uh, but what's important, in my view, is that we have an opportunity at the moment to begin to reimagine and redefine what Australia's security really means for the long term, for the years and decades ahead. Now, this year, uh, despite whatever you may think about the politics, uh, there is a striking confluence of policy reviews with a bearing on our national security broadly defined. And this is an opportunity, really, for input uh, from the wider community to, uh, to really shape policy thinking for the long term. We have a defence white paper uh, and a first principles review with all of their supporting classified assessments and reviews. And already, through the first principles review, which is, uh, of course, uh, fairly recently released, there are indications in its, uh, its follow-up of the government's and the Defence Department's seriousness about implementation. We've seen evidence here of a determination to drive cultural change in the national interest. There's a cyber security review, uh, on which I was very pleased to lead some consultations recently at the National Security College, which will lead to a public cyber security strategy a watershed opportunity, in my view, for Australia to craft and maintain a regional and global edge in this vital domain. There's a national counter-terrorism strategy in the works in the wake of the report into the Martin Place siege and a review into the effectiveness of our counter-terrorism mechanisms. Now, such a strategy needs to ensure a central and sustained place for counter-radicalisation as well as counter-terrorism. To all of this, we could add the recent Energy White Paper, and a white paper, a forthcoming white paper on developing Northern Australia. Now, while not principally about security, those two documents uh, have important bearings on our security broadly defined. So taken together, uh, we will in the months ahead have a clear and public accumulation of building blocks for a more integrated, more inclusive approach to national security policy. Some of the elements, if you like, of a national security strategy. And yes, another one of those in time would make sense. But why should we think anew about national security? Australia might argue, you might argue, some might argue, has hardly been more secure. It's true that in a world of transnational problems, we have the singular geopolitical advantage of an island continent. Our region, 
is relatively, the Indo-Pacific, thank you, Cam, our region is relatively prosperous and relatively peaceful. We have vast natural resource deposits and a developed economy that has undergone decades of growth. We have high per capita wealth and a resilient multicultural society. Above all, most of us have known perpetual peace, freedom from conflicts, external or internal freedom from fear. And I would argue that much of the fascination with ANZAC may be precisely because uh, conflict on that scale, war, is not known to most of us by direct experience. Now, looking to the present or to the future, many of us would seem to presume that whatever threats there may be today or whatever challenges may lie ahead, they will not fundamentally harm the democratic, comfortable Australia we know. Certainly, Australia has a highly professional national security community, so much of the response is in place. Relevant agencies and departments, uh, and I can attest to this, including through my work at the college, not to mention the ADF and the Federal Police, are substantially resourced, are resourced, are substantially joined up, are well led, they attract skilled and dedicated people. This community is better connected within itself than ever before. Federal and state experience is shared and lessons are learned. Now, of course, there's room to improve and we can come to that. Nor does Australia's national security effort lack high-level political attention, as we've said at the beginning. So given all of this, why bother thinking much about Australian national security? Why in particular should we, should we try to think about it anew? Well, the short answer is that in today's and tomorrow's world, Australia faces an era of change, of uncertainty and of fragility. And it's true to say that every era uh, is one in which there'll be voices such as mine who say there's great uncertainty, there's great complexity. But I do think that uncertainty and complexity are accumulating at present, uh, as, as many of us have never known and, and as I think is, is many, in many ways unprecedented in human history. So Australia's horizon of risk, if I can call it that, is expanding. Critically, the gap that matters most to our security now is no longer the so-called air-sea gap that has long provided a moat between Australia and the world. It is instead the gap between our national interests and our ability to protect and advance those interests. That gap is large and it is growing. What are those interests I speak of? Well, for a nation of 23 million people, Australia's interests are unusually extensive. Just consider the scale not only of Australia's vast territory, but our broader land and maritime jurisdiction, which combined makes up 5% of the Earth's surface. Australia benefits from an exceptional degree of connectedness to the world. This brings with it a reliance on rules, on order, the global commons, flows of trade, finance, information and people. In turn, these national strengths bring with them interests that are vulnerable and need to be protected. So, a contemporary definition of Australia's interests goes far beyond the obvious priorities of protecting the physical security of citizens, sovereign territory and resources. It includes also maintaining such aspects as national freedom of manoeuvre, independence of action, societal cohesion and our democratic political system. Australia will also need to work to maintain the conditions for prosperity too, including secure access to energy supplies and international markets. But overarching all of these imperatives, and this is, this is one factor I think that links together many of the disparate challenges that I'll speak of, overarching all of these imperatives, Australia will need to work to protect and to advance a stable and peaceful regional and international order. This requires partnerships with others, and those partnerships in turn are reasons for Australia to uphold a reputation as a secure, capable, reliable partner in the international system. We need to be seen as a country that is serious about protecting its interests in the context of a rules-based order and respect for the rule of law. Such international credibility or reputation as a security partner, I would go so far as to call it national honour, uh, with apologies to Thucydides, is both an asset and an interest in itself. Now, when these extensive national interests are considered alongside the patterns of change and risk in today's world, and we can point to any number of reports about projected global trends uh, that I refer to, changes in disruptive technology, in demographics, in the behaviour of states, the behaviour of non-state actors, uh, in climate change and so forth. When you project those interests against that horizon of change, one thing becomes clear, and that is, as I've said, the burden of risk on Australia's interests is accumulating. New risks are joining old ones on a crowded horizon. And therefore, we need to constantly be refreshing our thinking about how global trends will intersect and interact with our interests. 
Now, more immediately among that list of trends, and we can find more exhaustive lists if, uh, if you've time, two stand out for me at present. Uh, the most obvious two are these. Firstly, uh, coercion and risks of miscalculation and conflict escalation in our region of Indo-Pacific Asia. Uh, these risks have eased in the past six months, but that's, I think, a short-term easing. There are long-term structural challenges around power, power shifts continuing. These relate especially to how China is using its growing power and how other nations are responding. Strategic competition and conflict in Asia would directly challenge our security and economic interests as uh, a power very deeply enmeshed with the region. In that sense, uh, in my view, what happens in the South China Sea is our business too. And we need a clear and consistent sense of national policy on related issues. Policy based not on the rights and wrongs of territorial claims, but on principles of how disputes should be managed and principles about confidence building approaches to ensure that confrontation does not lead to crisis or crisis to escalation. The second risk I'll mention, of course, is violent extremism, jihadist terrorism globally and at home. I'll return to this a bit later on. Now, a critical question is how we manage the tension between this global and domestic uh, set of security issues. The global and domestic issue of terrorism and the Indo-Pacific regional power play. We can't focus on one of these challenges at the expense of the other. And of course, uh, not only is there a temptation to do so, it's very easy to do so, very understandable for policymakers to do so. Two years ago, if we'd spoken to the national security community and tried to uh, rank priorities, we would have been told that the 9-11 uh, the decade is beginning to ease away. We can focus more on geopolitical challenges in our region. Of course, that assessment has been thrown out by events in the past two years. But the Indo-Pacific regional strategic challenges have not gone away. Australia's region is becoming more central to global power balances and strategic tensions. Powerful economic connections, uh, more so than strategic connections, I would argue, are making this the era of the Indo-Pacific and the strategic connections follow the economic uh, connections. These patterns that I speak of include, of course, East Asian powers, deep and growing dependence on Indian Ocean sea lanes. It's wrong to say that the Indo-Pacific is all about the rise of India. It's more about the rise of China than the rise of India. China is the quintessential power that relies on the Indo-Pacific sea lanes far more than India at this stage. Uh, the interests of India as an East Asian power are a secondary part of this Indo-Pacific equation. Now, these patterns matter to Australia, uh, whether it's the fast emergence of China as an Indian Ocean naval power or the Act East policy of the Modi government in India. Uh, as the successful and simultaneous visits last year of Indian Prime Minister Modi and Chinese President uh, Xi Jinping spectacularly confirmed, Australia's region has found us and there's no turning back. So here with the Indo-Pacific, we have at last a definition of our principally Asian region that automatically includes Australia. I guess that's the good news for those of us, those of us who have long uh, thought and debated about Australia's place in the region. The downside is that this helps to make the region's tensions our problems too. But we don't have a choice. I don't think this is about a policy choice. This is an inevitability that is, that is coming to us regardless of our policy choices. We just have to work out how to respond. Regional power balances are changing with China's rise and rapid growth year after year in military spending. And yet, uh, as I've said, being closer to the world's economic and strategic centre of gravity makes it impossible for us to treat these unsettling regional security dynamics, uh, such as in the South China Sea, as if they were someone else's business. In all of this, I would contend Australia is actually far from helpless. Now, there is an idea uh, which you've all heard, that our strategic weight in its broad sense is insufficient for us to have any impact on regional order. I would argue that that view is outdated and exaggerated. Instead, we need to think hard about how to make our contribution. Uh, this includes how to encourage other regional powers through our own example in forming creative and functional middle player coalitions uh, with such Asian security partners as India, Japan and some of the Southeast Asian powers. Our central Indo-Pacific geography, our advanced maritime capabilities, and I know one or two friends from Navy will be pleased to hear me say that, our interoperability with the United States and our regional surveillance advantages, and I'd emphasise the surveillance edge, all provide an edge here. It's false in my view to say that the alliance with the United States comes at the expense of Asian partnerships or pragmatic multilateral diplomacy. 
uh, these approaches can be mutually reinforcing. Uh, for example, the presence of US Marines in Darwin is providing of benefit, is proving of benefit to Australia in engaging third countries in training, as confirmed by an exercise last year uh, involving China. There's also scope for us to work more with China as a security provider in the region, as the search for the MH370 airliner demonstrates, and we can come back to that uh, a, little bit, a little bit later on. But the challenge in all of this is to ensure that closer cooperation with China does not come at the expense of the US alliance or of regional solidarity in upholding the right kind of regional order, which is one that recognises China's legitimate interests while also upholding rules and discouraging coercion. Uh, we need to be realistic in this about the potential as well as the limits of security cooperation with China under conditions of mistrust. Now, navigating all of these complexities will require better resourcing in Australia of defence engagement or what might be called defence diplomacy. That side of Australia's uh, really defence policy has been treated as a third order issue for far too long. In all these circumstances, we need to work smarter combining diplomatic and security capabilities because our relative regional weight could well decline as other powers in the region increase their own through economic growth. These other powers do not only include China, they include Indonesia as well as India. We will want to focus on partnership with these powers while maintaining a sense of proportion and national self-respect. And for, for tragic and obvious reasons, uh, the near future is not going to be an active time in the Australia-Indonesia security relationship. Uh, but in all of this, we should look to the long term. And I would argue that the Australia-Indonesia security relationship, we will come back to this uh, no, matter, no matter what. Indonesia matters deeply to Australia. And of course, we need to reinforce the message that Australia matters to Indonesia. But looking more widely, uh, we should look at technological change as something that's on our side. It, oh, oh, it offers more opportunity to Australia than to risk. Uh, disruptive technologies uh, are, are coming into being. They will alter calculations and military advantage. Obviously, autonomous systems, uh, cyber, hypersonics, I, I could go on. We need to think freshly. We need to think anew about how to be on the right side of disruptive technology. Australia has unique opportunities, in my view, a combination of technology, geography and the US alliance to keep and even sharpen its edge in areas like surveillance and intelligence. Uh, we need to be willing to invest considerably more as a country in emerging capability areas like space, cyber and autonomous or at least unmanned systems. These areas of technology actually suit Australia. They suit the characteristics of our geography and our small but our educated population base. Now, above all, uh, and to reiterate, I guess, my starting point, our links with the outside world make Australia a vibrant, prosperous place, but they also make Australia a vulnerable space. Thus, for instance, many Australians, including in the business community, I'm pleased to say, are becoming increasingly aware of the ease with which cyberspace can be used for disruption and espionage by foreign entities. More Australians are also becoming concerned about the vulnerabilities of our seaborne uh, energy supply lines. All of the risks and vulnerabilities mentioned so far um, suggest that the number and kind of security contingencies and risks that could affect our interests in the years ahead will continue to grow. Australia's own security will therefore require a willingness to make judicious contributions to securing our lifelines to the wider world. Uh, as I've said, and really to, to, to move to a recapitulation and, and, and wrap this up, our interests are expanding, our capabilities, even if they're expanding, are not keeping pace. This place is a premium on partnerships. New threats have not replaced old ones that join them on a crowded horizon. We can't protect our interests alone, and yet to build the partnerships we need, we do have to have the credibility that comes from doing our best to provide for our own security uh, within, within reasonable limits and balancing other policy priorities. So the concluding question is, are we doing our best as a country? Well, we're still in a phase of transition from an Australia of decades past that relied for its security primarily on the combination of a benign and stable global and regional environment and a less demanding US ally than, than we're going to have. The strategic environment is becoming less stable. The ally is becoming more demanding and yet frustratingly less than clear sometimes about its own priorities, about its own strategy. Added to that, uh, as I said earlier, our own ability to set security priorities is going to be dispersed and challenged by worsening dangers and very present dangers of terrorism and radicalisation at home and worldwide. Now, amid these entirely justified present day fears, and we hear the Foreign Minister in particular articulating those uh, quite regularly at present, 
we mustn't lose sight of truly strategic risks. We don't want to find ourselves in a grand replay of the post 9-11 years. When concerns about terrorism, when expeditionary operations in the Middle East did overshadow concern about preparing for strategic change in the Indo-Pacific. So how do we set priorities amid this crowded, confusing horizon? How do we prioritise the immediate security threat of terrorism, the wider strategic problem of the changing Indo-Pacific regional order, and dealing with longer term trends like the security repercussions of environmental degradation of climate change? There's a simple answer, uh, which is easy for me to make, I'm not a policy maker. Uh, the simple answer is that we need a layered response that deals with each problem on its own time scale. That we can't pause to deal with one problem while waiting to deal with another problem further down the track. There's a, there's a staggered approach involved here. One thing that we should caution against is imagining that all of these risks exist somehow in parallel worlds. They interact. Uh, a common thread is the way in which they threaten order. And therefore, improving our ability as a nation to respond to one challenge, whether it's through demonstrating seriousness of purpose, building national resilience, forming security partnerships, can help to some degree in responding to others. Um, above all, in acquiring our own new security capabilities, and I guess this point goes to the, uh, the forthcoming Defence White Paper, we need to be constantly looking for flexibility and adaptability. Um, now, like it or not, devoting substantial resources to security, broadly defined, will need to be an accepted part of the Australian policy landscape for as far ahead as we can see. Uh, in all of this, it's hardly a context in which, as a country, we can afford a national security debate to become heavily partisan. I think we need a maximum of political consensus on these issues, and I know an argument can be had that, well, debate is a good thing, consensus is a dangerous thing, but I think... Um, there is consensus and there is consensus. And uh, I believe that there's a hidden fragility uh, in public thinking about security in this country, a potential fragmentation of public opinion and political, view, political views across many of the issues we've spoken about today. Uh, for instance, on how to respond to terrorism or how to manage strategic change in Asia. Just because this fragmentation is not reflected in the relative consensus we see in Parliament doesn't mean it's not there and it will become manifest uh, in a crisis. How cohesive is Australia on matters of security really? What do young Australians think about these issues? In a nation where more than one in four of us was born overseas, where major cities uh, like Sydney, uh, in major cities the population uh, in those cities more than one in three was born overseas. What do first and second generation migrants think about Australian national security issues? The answer to these questions, well, I can't give you a clear and comprehensive answer. There's polling, there's new research to be done, uh, but we need to know. One thing I, I can say with confidence is that we need an inclusive national security narrative. And I'm all for efforts to reimagine ANZAC to fit that mould, but ANZAC, no matter how far it speaks to citizenship rather than to her heritage, will have limits. It will not be enough to form the national security narrative uh, for Australia uh, for a very diverse multicultural Australia. We need more. It's, it's a building block, but it's not sufficient. More Australians from more places, including East Asia, South Asia and the Middle East, in other words, the regions that are also uh, at the centre of many of the security challenges that face us in the years ahead. This means a much more complex mosaic of views about security than Australian governments have needed to relate to in the past. And I think our policy community is still coming to grips with that challenge. This makes national consensus building harder on security. It also makes it more necessary. Now, of course, politics is not the only part of the national security house we need to get in order. And I have said in a previous speech that the Australian national security community, uh, the officials, policymakers, practitioners, need to get out more, need to get out of Canberra uh, a bit more. Uh, and I've, uh, I've even called them a cast uh, with an E on the end, in the, with the best of intentions. Confident in the knowledge that they're doing the right thing for the national interest, we can't afford for that security community to assume that the rest of the country will just let it get on with the job. It doesn't work like that. Uh, that means that there's a need for intensive, sophisticated public consultation and outreach, not as an afterthought, not as window dressing, but as a priority. Um, that's why it's worth noting, uh, as a positive in this speech, that there is, uh, I think, some, some pretty uh, impressive momentum at the moment towards community consultation on countering violent extremism, and I, I applaud uh, the efforts underway in that space. There are those in the community, though, who think that national security is not their problem, 
and indeed who think national security policy is the problem. Uh, those who sincerely hold those views, uh, and, I, and I respect that starting point, but I, I would argue that those who hold those views need to be willing to su suspend their preconceptions and certainly suspend their posturing and engage instead in a first principles conversation about how best to preserve the security and the cohesion of this society that has offered exceptional levels of political freedom, of personal opportunity, of physical safety. So, um, to begin to wrap up here, Australia's security problem requires multiple responses over multiple time frames. On terrorism, there's little question that counter-radicalisation and showing the emptiness of the Islamic State narrative are essential tasks. But even the best efforts on this front will take time and trust building. And in the meantime, it's imperative not only to minimise the number of Australians who are attracted to the terrorist cause, but to minimise the harm they can do. So right now, I would agree that the most pressing national security issue must be, must be about preventing further atrocities, atrocities of a kind that would damage social harmony in multicultural Australia. In many ways, what distinguishes terrorism from other threats, uh, even though the numbers involved can be quite small, and some will argue, well, by utilitarian measure, terrorism is not a major threat because the casualty numbers are relatively small. The difference is that terrorism is about challenging the trust and tolerance that is really at the core of a society like Australia's. And the effect of another terrorist attack, especially a larger scale incident than uh, the, uh, the Martin Place siege, has an, would have an effect on social trust that we don't know how to measure. We don't know how to repair. We haven't been there yet. We don't want to go there. So in my view, it's incumbent on the critics of counter-terrorism measures in Australia to offer instead their best ideas on how to reduce the chances of further terrorist attacks or to acknowledge that, that they have to have a willingness to risk those attacks and their impact, their potentially dreadful impact on Australia's core qualities of tolerance and trust. I would argue that a new and inclusive approach to Australian security must extend to other risks as well. Uh, it, it really involves a recognition that we need to face multiple challenges at once, some that can be met or deterred by military means, others that cannot. Ultimately, it requires uh, a recognition, I guess, as a nation that we need to step up our efforts to engage all the qualities we have, advanced technology, strategic geography, a strong ally, promising partners, a private sector increasingly conscious of security, and that's uh, very important on this point, an educated population and our cultural diversity, which of course is and can be harnessed as a major advantage. Now to match the new shape and potential of Australia's dynamic society, there need to be changes considered to patterns of recruitment, of employment, of education and the security community. This includes ensuring that employment related conditions and flexibility, including security clearance requirements and processes, can keep pace uh, with the changing nature of Australian society. That's a conversation we need to have. Uh, Australia has a great opportunity to maintain, for example, an edge in cyber security and to consolidate that edge. But we'll only do that if we can identify and attract and educate and retain large numbers of smart Australians from new generations and diverse backgrounds to work for the national interest in this critical domain. So just as Australia's political and social history has been a story about increasing inclusion, I'll conclude by arguing that inclusiveness is going to be the essential quality of a new Australian security. I'll leave it there and take the questions. Thank you.